<laughs> What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. The fastest rising baseball podcast in the nation. Almost at 100 subscribers on www.youtube.com, also known as YouTube, for those of you who are first time visitors AKA of the website. World Wide Web, that is, um, I think, dot com. So, <laughs> So, so, so first, so for you first time listeners, I'd like to introduce uh, my co-host here, who sits across from me, across state. Dímelo, cómo estamos. Writer, writer for Call to the Pen, actually editor of Call to the Pen, writer for right. Pitchers List, aka also, aka also, uh, his article was featured recently featured on Bleacher Report, the current MLB playoff picture. So. You caught us on there. Now you know who wrote, who was behind that. Uh, executive producer of El Forajido. <laughs> <laughs> a short film that was released back in the uh, 2016 era. Shout out to Mike. Mike era. Mazur. Goes by Manny Go 3 on Twitter. Mm -hmm. That would be none other than Manny Gomez. Manny, say, say what's up. What's up, guys? Um, and and I'd like I'd like to return the favor if if you if you will, the man with multiple names, Luis Angel, aka L.A., aka Hollywood, aka Chocolate Thunder, aka Chanche, according to my grandparents back in the day. R.I.P. There he is, the hottest man in New Jersey. Look at that beard. You realize how many people could figure out the passwords to all my accounts. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot Chanche El Grupo Trueno. By the way, he just froze on us. Um, Got to check that internet. Luis Angel. You, you froze there? on us. Were you, were you, were you, you froze on me. Were you hearing me? Ah, it was me. Your internet connection is unstable. Just came up. Perfect timing, huh? Ouch. It might be because everyone and their fucking sisters live here now <laughs> and it's connected to the internet and has multiple devices connected to the internet. Um, I'm keeping that in. Okay. So, <laughs> Manny, so as, as I said, I forgot to mention Chanche El Grupo Trueno, by the way, you guys haven't heard this merengue group. You go on youtube.com. There's a, I think it's 173rd OST. Is that how it is? That YouTube channel? Let's not get into that <laughs> right now, man. Those are things we're trying to bury in the world right. of the internet. So, Manny, a little something different that we usually do on this show. We want to go through some, some things that happened today, September 22nd, in baseball. Uh, just to give, a, just to give some, some, to kind of like give you some reference to what we're, the current juice ball era that we're living in. In today, in today, in 2018, the Dodgers established a franchise record for team home runs hit in one season for the second consecutive year, which means they established a new record, but they had just broken that record the year before. So if you don't think the balls are juiced, they're juiced. Oh, they're juiced. If you need, need, you need not look any further than what the Yankees did during that 10-game win streak. They were hitting home runs left and right. And there was a dude in uh, Cleveland, maybe, who had played, who played like 200 or 300 minor league games without a home run. And in his second MLB game, he hit a bomb. So yeah. balls are definitely juice. But I'm, I'm okay with it. I've embraced it. Here's just a random one. In 1988, the Mets clinched their fourth NL East title when Ron Darling goes the distance, defeating the Phillies at Shea Stadium 3-1. to one. So in the 80s, the Mets clinched their fourth NL East title. Since then, probably got like, what, like two more? In what an embarrassment. What an embarrassment of an organization. Those are just two random things that happened last, uh, not last, those are just two random things that happened September 22nd. Uh, I think we're going to go through one every time we record just to kind of get a feel of where baseball's been the last 150 years. And, and it, you uh, just, you just reminded me of something I saw recently. So you're giving us what happened in the past something related to the Mets that happened recently or that a story that came out recently is that apparently Steve Cohen is going to make a run at Brian Cashman next year, try to swipe I him away from the Yankees. Did you see that? Yeah. But realistically, I don't think that's going to happen, right? Like we don't really think that's going to happen. 
I mean, it, it would be, I think it would be the craziest story, Yankee story in a very long time because Cashman's been with the organization for like 30 years or some shit. All of a sudden, he's just going to up and go. You know what I mean? Yeah. Why would he so, leave? And especially, why would he go from the Yankees to the Mets? I mean, come on, guys. Let's be real here. Well, I think for him, it'd be more of like a challenge. Like, you know, how much credit does Brian Cashman get for World World Series? Like, let me show you what I can do with the Mets. A, you know a what? Team though? That's, a team that's snake bitten, clearly. I think, I think that his reputation is starting to change a little bit. A lot of people like to shit on Brian Cashman. And I get it. I understand that he's been here for a long time. He's pretty much had an open checkbook for most of his career. So, you know, maybe he wasn't as responsible as everybody makes it out to be for the early championships. But if you think about this season, the guys that have carried this team were Brian Cashman moves. We're talking Gio Urshela is having a, a great season for the Yankees. That's a Brian Cashman move. Luke Voigt traded for Jason Shreve to the St. Louis Cardinals. That's a Brian Cashman move. Um, a lot of these... A lot of these maneuvers, the fact that Glaber Torres is on this team, that's a Brian Cashman move. You know what I'm saying? Like, a lot of yeah. this is attributed to Cashman. It's not just opening the checkbook like they did for Garrett Cole this year. Um, so I, I'm starting to, to kind of be on his corner. I've always been on his corner. I'm a Yankees fan. But I, th I think a lot of the criticism is uncalled for. I think Yankees fans are super impatient and irrational sometimes but you're not gonna get what, that here guys what would yeah what would uh what would brian cashman be coming to with the mets by the way like besides the grom pete alonzo has regressed a little bit even though he he's i think he's hit a lot of home runs for a shortened season i think he's at 11 i think the leader in the nl is last time we spoke was 16 mm -hmm. so i think 11 home runs is, is a good number of home runs in a 60 game season Mm -hmm. uh, but besides Jacob DeGrom, like, what is he coming to? Like, an aging Cano with a lot of money on the table that he's owed? You know what? Like, even the Mets roster, I feel like they're not as bad as we, as we think they are. Like, Dominic Smith has been a beast this season. You, ha you, have a good, you have a good offense in that team. You have, I know, like you said, Peter Alonso is struggling. He's batting 202 with a, with a 713 OPS. But maybe it's a sophomore slump. Maybe, maybe we see the real Pete Alonzo next year. Or, or maybe this is the real Pete Alonzo. We don't know. But anyway, we have Jeff McNeil, who's a really good hitter. A guy like Michael Conforto in our net, net run stat. He was in the top 25 as recent as last week. So he's a decent hitter. You have, uh, you know, Cano can still swing the bat. He was, he was raking for a couple of weeks there. Uh, I think they have a good enough team. You're going to have Syndergaard is going to come back next year, DeGrom. Um, and if they're smart, they should go out and get another starting pitcher, maybe Trevor Bauer, somebody like that, or get another, or get a bullpen arm like a Kirby Yates. Because if you look at, 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 uh, at what the fuck is his name? Oh my God. Eduardo Rodriguez. Rodriguez. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, if you look at his numbers, he's actually having a really good season. I just think maybe he can't handle the pressure of the ninth inning. No, I'm sorry. So, <laughs> Eduardo Rodriguez is a pitcher That's for the Red, Red Sox. Sox. Edwin, um, Edwin Diaz Edwin is Diaz. the guy. Edwin yeah, Diaz. Yes, 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 yes. We're a baseball podcast. <laughs> yeah, we yeah, know yeah. these things. We don't fact check. Um, he's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's having a pretty good season. I think that maybe yeah. he can't handle the pressure of the ninth inning. Move him up to the eighth inning. And all of a sudden, Jerry's Familia is a seventh, sixth, seventh inning pitcher. He's not, you know, in the eighth Excuse inning me. setting up for Diaz. Yes. Did Sorry. you just did you just admit there's a there's a such thing as a ninth inning pressure? The <laughs> did did we just have a breakthrough moment here? Okay, and the I, welcome to I the believe, show podcast. I believe that a pitcher. I feel like it's a mindset thing. I feel like a pitcher can make it make the moment bigger than what it really is, and I feel like Edwin Diaz is one of those guys who, in that moment, the pressure of that moment gets gets to him. So give him – maybe he needs to know that there's going to be somebody else that comes after him, that it's not going to fall on his shoulders. But I feel like he has the skill set. If he could just get out of his head, like A-Rod always did. You know what I mean? Uh, I've been going to say A-Rod. little A-Rod nope. shade. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm I trying think, to say. You know what I but, think would be an interesting stat to look at? Sorry to cut you off. Let's hear it. How, how closers do in – home games versus away games because technically like if you blow it if you blow a uh 
they, to me, there, there's more of a, there's more pressure to close a game out away because there's, if you blow it, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. Know? That's true. So it'd be, it'd be interesting to look at that, but, um, what, we what I'm trying to say this? is that, that the Mets aren't <laughs> as bad as we think they are. I think that well, Brody Van Wagenen is a fucking idiot. Let's let's just put that out there. Um, and I love Luis Sorohas. Let's give him another season. Part of the Alou family. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna throw shade at that guy, but I, I don't know. I just feel like they've just been run poorly. I feel like the the, the franchise is almost like snake bit or something. And maybe Steve Cohen coming in will wipe the slate clean. The guy's going to, he's going to apparently spend money. He's willing to spend money. So let's see what he does with that money. So the Mets, I think the Mets up until recently, I don't know about the last couple of days were the number one team in terms of like batting average, uh, weighted runs created plus. Wow. You like that stat? Ah, WRC you didn't think plus. I, you didn't think I knew about that, but uh-huh. I do. So, but doesn't, tr- it's not translating into wins. Obviously guys like Michael Walker, Rick Porcello, are having terrible seasons. Yeah, man. Literally, literally Jacob DeGrom is the only one. Uh, I don't even know what happened to Steven Matz anymore. Like, what, what's up with that guy? Is, is he out of the bullpen now at this point? They just let so, Zach Wheeler go. You know what I mean? Like, So it's it's almost like the Mets can never click at the same time. No. Nah. Right? Um, and maybe they're, not, maybe they're not hitting in the situations where runners are in scoring positions because I feel like even though DeGrom's – Yesterday they didn't score enough runs for him, but his two previous starts they 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 scored a lot double digit runs in both of those starts. But maybe they're just not doing it in situational uh, hitting, you know. Um, By the way, I do, I do first think the are first in, yeah first in batting average, first in on base. You you were right, first in WRC plus, and second in WOBA, uh, which is like an enhanced version of slugging. Like it, it it's Can a you better explain- measure. Yeah. Can you actually explain Wobo to us, or do you actually not know what that is? And I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. I, I, the, see, the problem is like I I can't explain how it's calculated. The way that I the 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 way that I understand it is that it's an enhancement of slugging. Like average just tells you how many hits a a, a player yeah. has per at bat. On base tells you how often a player gets on base. Obviously, slugging tells you more like the type of hitter that he is like, yeah, he gets, he, he has this type of batting average, but he's more of a power hitter versus a contact hitter. Woba yep. is even more accurate. Like it, it, it gives you, it gives you a more accurate picture of who the hitter is. It's like, it's an enhancement of slugging. That's the way that I think about it. How do you calculate it? I have no fucking clue. That's, that's the problem probably, with these stats is that they're confusing as fuck. Well, I know that when they ever have that plus, or the weighted, yeah. it's more, it's more, well, the, the weighted. Adjusted to the park and stuff like that. Yeah, it's adjusted to the park. Yeah, all that stuff. So guys yeah. in course Field will have, like, lower Wobos and. Truth. I'm into it. I'm hip to the new lingo. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what, you know what stat people should get into, though? Net runs, man. That's all I'm saying, man. We got to come up with a more catchier name than net runs. I know. There has to be a catchier name, like weighted net runs plus jizz or something i don't know like i have no idea <laughs> titties yeah uh, titty runs um i just brought us down a whole bunch of notches but anyway this is not getting recommended to anybody on <laughs> no, no. and by the way how, how if we were to break this up into multiple episodes what would that like if we ended the segment right now what would that first episode be i would say it would have been about brian cashman and maybe going to the mets okay okay seems like a, that seems like a good way to segue all right. To something else. Let's move on. Let's move on to the playoff picture real quick. Since that, that is what put us on Bleacher Report. Um, let's talk about it. Playoff picture. Guess which team is currently the seventh seed in the National League? I know what you want me to say, Manny. Mm-hmm. But I, let's just, before I get into that, this is the team that you had going to the World Series, correct? I mean, I, I don't know. I'd have to go back and check, but I think no, I, I know. Going to- <laughs> I know. Oh, I know. And by <laughs> no, the way, I'm kidding. I actually don't know. I'm trying to justify that by like, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me right now because I'm, un- I'm unprepared. My daughter has been sleeping at, at night, so I'm very tired. Um, but the Cincinnati Reds, I believe, have the third best pitching staff in baseball. I could just go to Fangraphs and check it. 
Mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I'm basing this on here. If you get to the postseason and you have to face Trevor Bauer, who's been out of this world this year, Luis Castillo has been good this year, Sonny Gray, I don't know if he's healthy or not, but when he was healthy, he was pitching like the Sonny Gray of the Oakland A's in his prime. Um, that's a tough one, two, three to go against. So if they're the seven seed today, they would be facing off against the Atlanta Braves, who all they have is Max Freed in the rotation. Mm-hmm. Um, their rotation is ranked. Let me check real quick. The Braves rotation is currently ranked. I feel like I'm screaming, by the way. I think you're fine. Ranked 17th in baseball. The Reds are ranked fifth. They are the third best rotation, according to war, in, in the National League. So I, I would I, – honestly – just on pitching, if you if you think pitching wins playoff games, I think the Reds can can beat the Braves in a three game series. I take, I mean, I, I take between Bauer and Freed this season. I think I take Bauer. Between Freed and Bauer, yeah, in a in like a first game, yeah, I think I think I would take Bauer. You know, Freed, Freed's been pretty really really good this year. Uh, fun and then, fact. And then who's the game two pitcher? Yeah, go ahead. I guess the game two, I'd go with Sonny Gray for, for the, experience. Yeah, for but the then how about for the Braves? That's, that's I think, oh, the, Braves, the Braves. The Braves rotation is shot. Cole Hamels isn't going to pitch. You have Josh Tomlin, Kyle Wright. I fucking, excuse my language, but that not Tomlin, fucking not bastard, Tomlin. man. Please but Josh Tomlin. Tomlin's not going to win. It's going to be Tomlin. Who else is starting for them? I don't like seeing Tomlin on a mound anymore, man. I think that guy needs to find a spot in the bullpen and stay there. You got Sean Newcomb, who's in the who's in the minors. They don't have any any pitching. Sean Shane Green, but he's more well, of know, a reliever now. But you know what the Braves do have? Hitting. Freddie, Freddie Freeman. Freeman. Yeah, exactly. Who may be this year's MVP and the leader in net runs? I think I saw that on a Bleacher Report yeah. article somewhere. He is. Not yeah. a Bleacher Report, son. Not a Bleacher mm. Report. That, that would be welcome to the that. show. That stat, that stat <laughs> is so savory of of God. good info you, that I, I bought. Fun You're fact, like, Manny. Yeah, go ahead. Fun fact. Uh, the since as of yesterday, the Cincinnati Reds are one game above five hundred. Mm-hmm. Since when? Take a guess. Since, since today. <laughs> since, <laughs> o- <laughs> since opening day, when they won their first game, ah, and then went on a four-game losing streak. They've been crawling out of that hole ever since. So, I don't know, man. Cincinnati Reds look more like pretenders to me. I know what you're saying about the pitching and doing damage, but they need to they need to win these. I think they're still trying to even if they're even if they clinch a, a playoff spot, they'd like to be more than just a 7 seed. So, I feel like they're going to be pitching their guys uh on short rest. They're going to mm-hmm. want them to go deep. Um and then once they're in the playoffs, there is no rest. There's yeah, no, no rest days no in the playoffs. Teams. So we're probably only looking at a one Trevor Bauer start per series mm-hmm. unless they really want to push this guy, which he probably doesn't want to do because he's looking for a contract next season. So truth. I, I like the, the Reds. But. At the same time, the other teams have to deal with the same type of issue. And now, so the problem with the Reds is that their offense is atrocious. I think they, they're on pace to set them and the Texas Rangers are on pace to set a strikeout record. They're ranked on on uh, Fangraphs 21st in baseball in offense. Um, even though they have guys in that lineup that could do damage, they have Eugenio Suarez, they have Joey Votto, they have Nicholas Castellanos, they have a decent lineup. So say they catch fire. We've seen this before. Say they catch fire, you know, in this last week. They had a, they played a really, really good game against the Brewers yesterday. I was watching the Reds of all teams yesterday. Mm-hmm. Um I can see it happening. But then again, I'm just rooting for them to get to the World Series so that the Yankees can spank them and win it in four for the 28th world title. That's all I'm saying. I think what's pretty interesting about this. I know. I know. I know it was a joke. You need to tell me that, man. But <laughs> I, think what's, I think what's really interesting about these postseason matchups is that the Reds haven't faced the Braves at all this season and vice versa. They've only faced in this side of the in the NL side of of things. They've only faced the Cardinals and the Cubs. If the playoffs started today, one of those teams are eliminated. So to me, it's going to be a total crapshoot. Yeah. Because, yeah, the Braves don't match up 
perfectly with the with the with the Reds in pitching. But the Reds haven't pitched to that lineup yet. Obviously, it goes both ways, vice versa. Um, and I and I think that's that's going to be probably the most interesting thing about these series. Uh, and of course, if they get to the World Series, and so do the White Sox. They've played the White Sox this year already, mm-hmm. so that'd be like the only time they they cross over. But yeah, because it's a uh, regional. So in yeah. the in the in the National League playoff picture, if the season were to end today. It would be the one seed Dodgers versus the eight seed Phillies, the four seed Padres versus the five seed Marlins, the two seed the two seed Braves versus the seven seed Reds, the three seed Cubs versus the six seed Cardinals. The only matchup there in which the teams have faced each other is the Cubs and the Cardinals, the three and six seeds, um, which is pretty interesting. And the in the AL, it it's a different story. It's the it would be the Rays versus the Blue Jays. The Twins versus the Yankees, the White Sox versus the Indians, the Oakland A's versus the Astros. So in so this playoff everybody picture, has, everybody has faced each other <laughs> except for the Yankees and the Twins. And then that that series is important. the The Yankees and the Twins is a is a t- two teams to look at this final week because they want that four seed so that they can have home field advantage. Yeah, but the only the only team outside of the first three teams. Uh, is the four seed that would have home field home field advantage, and currently the Twins have it. So, um, and the Twins face the Reds. The Twins finish off their season versus the Reds. Wow, look at this, man! Look at all these connections here, man. Fuck. So it's like a Tarantino movie. So what do you what are you thinking about the AL side of things now? Like, what as do a, we think about as, the Rays possibly uh, winning the division? For the first time in, I don't know how long it's been, but if you want to throw the Reds in my face, the World Series prediction, I'm going to throw the Rays in your face because to start yeah, yeah. the season, oh, I was you, wrong about that. You didn't have any faith in the Rays at all. But you know what? I was wrong about that. But I, I know I'm not the only one. I got to stop being so scared about giving my hot takes like this, and I'm also <laughs> going to stop giving so many hot takes because the Rays get no love from None. any of the away team uh commentators yesterday i was listening to the to the mets game with they were versus the rays the rays beat the mets versus jacob Degrom. they used six pitchers it was a classic ray classic rays victory uh and and the, they were they were showing the rays no love they were like yeah you know you look at this team on paper they're not that good i'm like well they are pretty good like <laughs> they're good they're about they're about to win the al east so I don't and know, man. The, maybe by maybe the way, they're, the con- they're consistently good. They're consistently yeah. good. I think it's the stadium. It's like you would you wouldn't know if this was a pandemic, if we're in the middle of a pandemic or not, if you base it on the crowd at Tropicana Field because it's empty yep. there in a regular season. So I think that's part of it. Um, but really, if you think about it, if you look uh, for the past ten or fifteen years, maybe they haven't been in the postseason every single year, but they're always in contention and they always have a really low payroll. So we always talk about the A's being like that little engine that could, that's always in the hunt. The Rays are, are the same, the same type of team. And, and if nothing else, they, they're innovative too. Like they're the ones that started the, the opener, which everybody hates. And I love, um, and the way that they utilize their bullpen is no other team does that. Like everybody talks about the Yankees bullpen. The Rays bullpen is way better, way better. Yeah. Like this kid, this guy, kid, he's old already. Ro, have you seen Ro's breaking ball? I, like who, yeah. who could hit that shit? And it's not like Adovino who could never find the strike zone. This guy fucking can hit the strike zone, get guys out. And he's like not even like their best reliever. I don't even know who their best reliever is. Nick Anderson would be their best reliever. Yeah. Like, he, I mean, he's the, he is their go-to high leverage guy, I guess yeah. you would say in your, in your, in your terms. Um, Yesterday he had... Oh my God, that last inning was so funny. Robinson Cano just kept fouling off everything that Nick Anderson on an 0 2 count, by the way. He wasn't 1 2 until like the sixth pitch in the at bat. And he just kept fouling everything off, fouling everything off. Then he followed. Eventually, he gets Robinson Cano out after like 11 pitches, but then he matches up. Uh, he pitches to Pete Alonso next, who he had him at 3 0 to start off the at bat. Three fastballs down the middle. Pete Alonso couldn't touch it. I know you can argue that Pete Alonso is having like a down season, but still, like it's Pete mm-hmm. Alonso, yeah. three and zero, oh, three fastballs. He couldn't touch it, so I would say Nick Anderson is their best uh, relief pitcher. And 
Speaking of the A's, they clinched the uh, the AL West. Yep. It's not the Astros. How every, it's how we've seen it in the last every like, three team years. except for the Astros, Indians, and Blue Jays have clinched the playoff berth, and the Indians could clinch tonight. Their magic number is one. Um, the mm-hmm. Blue Jays' magic number is four, and the Astros' magic number is also four. Speaking of the Astros, Justin Verlander has Tommy John surgery. I don't know, man. I like. Would you hang it up? I think they're. I think they're done. Personally, the Astros. George, I call him Jorge because I'm partial to my Latino brothers and sisters out there. His name is really George. He's not even. He's not even Latin. Um, <laughs> I think is he? He looks. He looks. George Springer. He's he. He has some flavor in there. I think. Right, yeah. Fuck it. We'll take him. Um, <laughs> we'll claim him. But he's yeah. He's a free agent. I don't know if this is the real Jose Altuve or not. I think he's still hurt. Um, Alex Bregman just came back. Michael Brantley's a year older. I think he's a free agent next year too. I'm not sure, but I don't know. I think this team is. I mean, they still got now. Yaron Alvarez. Uh, th- this dude pitching this year is having a pretty decent season. Yeah, I don't know if they're back. If they're ever going to get back to this dominating team that we've known these last couple of years. But I'm not going to rule out the Astros just yet. I should have mentioned this when we were talking about the Rays, but I think the Rays with the win tonight clinch the the East. I believe. Uh, be, uh, uh, probably because the Yankees are the Yankees are 31 and 23. The Rays are 36 and 19. So they're four games back, more than four, four and a half games back. And there's the season ends on like Sunday. So there's not that many games. Yeah, you're probably right. They probably clinched mm-hmm. tonight. But it's okay. That's fine. I'm good. Let me get that four. Let me get that four seed. And I'm good. All right, man. Let me get that four seed. That's all I want in life. Um, right okay. now. With the Yankees, I sent out a tweet. I think it was like two days ago. I kind of wish that that hot streak had come like this week and not last week. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I feel like the team that wins the World Series often is the one that's entering the postseason the hottest. And the Yankees were like, they were unbeatable in that 10 game stretch there. Um, And the last two games, they look a lot like that team that was uh, five and 15 in that 20 game stretch. It's only, it's only, you know, Garrett Cole goes tonight. So that might change. Jay Happ has been pitching like a fucking Cy Young award winner. Um, So I might be eating my words, but I kind of wish that that hot streak had come a week later, not, not sooner. So we can pretty much say this is the Yankee segment that we're getting into here. Sure, why not? Yeah, man, I think that whole Jay Happ thing is going to blow up in your face in the postseason. <laughs> and, and here's why, Manny. Yeah, he's been pitching lights out. Uh-huh. Uh, but those starts have come against the Boston Red Sox. Yes, that team sucks, man. Oof. The Baltimore Orioles. Uh, better than the Red Sox. The Toronto Blue Jays, who I will give credit for, are a nice lineup, but they were missing Bo Bichette. Bad, bad rotation. I don't. I think the the Blue Jays. I again, I can eat my words because they've beaten the Yankees a lot this year. It seems like, but if if we're gonna rely on pitching, I don't really believe on the Blue Jays and the Blue Jays too much in the postseason. Go on. Okay. Uh, then he get he lost a game to the Mets, which we just established the Mets are a good lineup. So credit to him. But before that, he did have a good start against the against the Mets, seven innings. No earned runs, five strikeouts. Mm-hmm. And that's a pretty much where we would start, I guess. You skip that next Mets start. He's been pretty lights out ever since. But honestly, man, I think this guy is going to implode in the playoffs. That start will lead to an early bullpen call, which will lead to those arms being tired for the rest of the series, which will lead to more pressure on the lineup, which leads to – you see where I'm going with this, man. So you're saying he's so, going to do what he did in 2018 because he was hot ending that season. And then he came, he went up against the Red Sox. I think it was what game. I'm, what what game I'm was saying, that? what I'm saying is that I, I, I had meant if work didn't get in the way, I had meant to outline Jay Happ's career and timeline sense mm-hmm. to see every time he peaks and drops and peaks and drops. And I think right now we're going through a peak. And I think that will show it will it will come to light the down the down the downturn the down peak will show itself in the playoffs i'm sorry to tell you but 
That's just okay. the way it is. Okay, That's whatever, just the way it is. Whatever you say. All they I'm saying is last play. last six games, one nine three ERA. Um, uh, I think he struck out. Let me see, thirty five batters and walked just five in thirty seven and a half innings. He's the only Yankee to to pitch into the eighth inning, and he did it two times this year. He, according to Katie Sharp, shout out to Katie Sharp, um, first Yankee since Mike Mussina did this against the Red Sox on September second, two thousand and one. That that near perfect game that we talked about where you, where you missed that uh trivia question remember that remember when you yep. missed that trivia question i remember uh first pitcher since then to 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 toss eight plus innings and strike out nine batters in fenway park since 2001 so i'm not saying that jay hap is you know fucking garrett cole i wrote an article on call to the pen yesterday where i said uh, it's called how jay hap might have bested garrett cole in 2020 it's a shortened season so keep that in mind um, but I think he has a chip on his shoulders. They did everything in their power to skip this guy to start the year because he was so bad. He has a clause on his contract where he needs to pitch a certain amount of innings in order to be in order for his contract to be picked up for next season. And I think he, he has every incentive in the world to to try to get the Yankees to keep him on the squad. And. Yeah, I'm not saying that I want him back next year, but if he can help us get to that 28th world title, we'll give him that, you know, you know, we'll do what the Red Sox did. We'll give him that that uh thank you contract. We'll give him that thank you one year deal. That that Mitch Moreland, not Mitch Moreland, what's his name? Steve Pierce contract. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I'm looking at Jay Happ's career splits. Mm-hmm. He's he's historically a way better pitcher in September than he is any other month. You just trying to? Why are you trying to shit on my parade here? What's going on? Because because I watched <laughs> because I watched that Jay Happ start against the Red Sox, mm-hmm. and he didn't just look good. He was it didn't make dominating. Sense, yeah. He was uh-huh. dominating to the point where I was like, are, are they swinging and missing on purpose? Because but no, and honestly, he was dominating in that start, and I just don't see how the hell the baseball gods give him that ability in the playoffs like could the Yankees use any more help in the playoffs I don't yeah. I don't think that's I don't think that's right but no he's literally, literally seriously like way better in September and October than he is any other month and I'm just saying mostly September because how often does he pitch in October well now, I'm looking at his uh stats for October and if you cumulative cumulative cumulatively they don't look good like he has a 504 ERA for his career a 1.76 whip but if you really dig in deeper, those numbers are inflated because of what he did against the Red Sox in 2018 and because of uh, a performance in 2009 against the Colorado Rockies. Aside from that, he's, been, he's pretty decent in the postseason. So I, I'm not going to say that I have confidence in, in J-Hap. I went as far as to say in that article that he might be the number two starter for the Yankees because James Paxton is, is gone probably. Um, at this point, if he's still pitching like this, like we'll see how he does this week. I think he has one more start left this week. I think you do give him that number two slot and see what he does. And then you, you end the series with Masahiro Tanaka. They were debating whether or not Davey Garcia should be the number three starter in the postseason. I think Jay Happ has earned his, his, his spot there. I think he, he, he's earned it. And if he fucks up, Yankees fans are going to be pissed, but let's be real. Like he, he, he earned it. What else, what else would you do? Right. I mean, so it's to be Garrett Cole, Happ, Tanaka. Davy Garcia out of the bullpen, I would say maybe in case. Okay. Yeah, man. In a longer look- series, then you insert Davy as your four, as your number four starter, and maybe you have Garrett Cole pitching on short on short rest. I don't know. I don't know what you do, man. With no. If I had days, told you, oof. if I had told you at the start of the season that only one Yankee starter would make it to the eighth inning, you would you would assume it would have been Garrett Cole. Garrett Cole, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's crazy, man. Love baseball. Love for baseball. that reason. I want to show right. the Red Sox some. I want to show the Red Sox some love here at the end of the season. By the time we record again, the season will be over, so we'd be looking ahead to next season. We've been looking ahead to next season already mm-hmm. uh, for the Red Sox fans. But I just gotta say, man, Tanner Houck, Hoke, yeah. Tanner Tanner Hoke, however you pronounce his name, the right-handed Chris Sale. I saw a cool GIF from Pitching Ninja where he flipped Tanner to the left side. And it, it looks pretty identical to Chris. Oh, Hale. really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so shout out to him. 
back to back starts to start off his career. Yeah, it's just pretty two much starts. <clears throat> two starts to start off his career where he was dominating. Pretty much shout out the <laughs> best team according to Manny over here, the best team yeah. in baseball, the New the York Dodgers? Yankees. Shut him out. Did you say Yankees? Uh, did you just go A Rod on us? Did I? I think you did, man. I got I got all my jokes mixed up, man. Damn. I'm gonna let me let me mark this this uh damn, there's no time on, on Zoom. I was gonna mark it so that I can replay it like on a loop. Yankees, Yankees, Yankees. By the way, I'm looking at his minor league star, uh, stats. He's, I mean, what he's doing in the big leagues doesn't mirror what he what he was in the minors, but he he doesn't seem like a bad pitcher. I wonder what took so long to to call this guy up. I don't know, but he, I, I I can't speak on what he did in the minors. I know he was drafted twice. The first time he was drafted like in the twelfth round, but then by the time the Red Sox drafted him in 2017, 2016, mm-hmm. he was the first round, so he was a first round pick for us. I don't. I can't talk about what he's done in the minors, but the start against the Yankees, he was dominating. Like he was yeah, yeah. just like really clean, really, really good for for a team like us that doesn't have anybody pitching right now. It says like Perez. Yeah. So, okay, um, so let, let's stay with with Yankees Red Sox here. A lot of Red Sox fans are excited that baseball's probably going to base their their draft on record. So you guys are probably going to have you're going to have a top three pick in the draft but how excited could you possibly be if nobody's playing you know what i mean like you could pick somebody who who people are projecting to be uh a really good player but you're kind of riding blind here because you're going you're when you pick someone in a draft you're picking someone at their most vulnerable like you could pick a a player who looks dominant and all of a sudden like like the i'm going to use the yankees as an example they kept touting, I think his name was. Was he a catcher? God, I can't remember what his name was. Not was Jason the, Dominguez. Not was that it the kid. Catch, was it the catcher that they traded for Pineda? I can't remember who it was. Um, but there have been pitchers in the Yankees minor league system. Uh, Manny Banuelos or something. like The, the guys like that who, who got so much hype and they came up and they looked really good. And that, like, who are they now? They like, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's so, it varies so much. This draft, I would feel the least confident in picking somebody because I'm not seeing what they can do. Like these guys in the alternate sites, all they're doing is working out in a baseball stadium alone. You know what I mean? Like they're not facing other people. It's weird. This, this, no, this is such a weird season. I know what you're saying, but I mean, everybody's in that same boat. Everybody's on the very- same boat. At the very least, we we tr- we draft a guy in the first round. He now has the value of a first round draft pick. So, I mean, at the worst case scenario, we trade him for his val whatever his value is at the time. You know, yeah. so everybody's in the same boat. Honestly, I don't really pay attention to draft boards when it comes to baseball because a lot of these guys will never even see a professional baseball field like at the major league level. So. I can't get so excited for those things. I just got to trust that the front office is doing their due diligence and that we'll be all right. Okay. Um, speaking of former prospects, I think we got to get rid of Michael Chavis, man. I'm not feeling this guy at all. Every time he comes up to bat, I feel like it's an automatic out. He's not doing as terrible as like Gary Sanchez was. I don't know if we would consider Gary Sanchez like out of his – rut already because he's he's been hitting the ball pretty hard lately but i'm not a fan of shavis right now man um that's all i had to say about him i didn't really have to go any further so, okay so so I, like i always joke about this but shavis is was known before he came up last season and and was hitting really well he was known for for failing a ped test you know what i'm saying like so how much of his production could we base upon performance enhancing drugs? Because you're right. Like he was hot to start the season last year, but if you look at his numbers, he, his numbers weren't that great to finish the season in the first place. Like he had a 766 OPS to finish the year. And the way he was hitting at, at certain points, you would think that he was like, he was like hey, one look, of the most pr- promising players in baseball. You know what I mean? No, I, th- I think what he had was just a lot of big home runs yeah. in key moments. And we kind of get blinded by that. I don't know how much I would attribute to like PEDs because I'm convinced that the balls are juiced. Um, so my thought, my reasoning for taking PEDs would be to feel 
more up to playing baseball games at any given moment, like over the course of an entire season, but it's a shortened season. So I feel like no one's really in the need of that, like kind of like extra push. So I don't know what to think about PEDs. I'm just going to pretend like it wasn't even a part of his game before, but even with all that, like, I just think, uh, you know, he's he not going to pan out too. Yeah. He strikes out a lot. And, and that's to me, he's not going to pan out into a major league power hitter. Like we think mm-hmm. speaking of somebody else that also strikes out a good amount, Bobby Dalbeck, Dalbeck, Bobby Dalbeck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I read an article today. They're comparing him to Aaron judge. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I mean, that's a good thing, but mostly because he has like this raw power, which he does yeah. by the way, man, this guy is like, it's crazy. I'm not getting, see, I'm not getting the same Chavis feeling about him. Cause mm-hmm. when I see this guy, he's a, he's, he's a pretty big dude. He has a really nice swing um, and he's producing right now. So I think that's something to look forward to in the next season. And the last thing I'm going to say about the Red Sox is I can't doubt Raphael Devers anymore. He turned his season around to me. He's put mm-hmm. together like a pretty good season. He has to be in the top three for like OPS at this point for our team. I don't know. Um, I and- think Rafi is aside from Xander Bogarts and Xander, is more complete. So he's, I think he's your best player for sure. But Rafi yeah. Devers is in the conversation. He just hits the ball really, he just hits the ball really, really hard. Yeah. This is just me being nitpick. Oh, by the way, there's something else I wanted to talk about. If you want to just segment into, I'll save it for another segment. But with the Red Sox, I feel better going into next season than I did about a month ago when we were already out of the playoff hunt. Mm-hmm. And I was just looking at the team like, what the fuck are we going to do? And J.D. Martinez, complete ass this season. Yeah. They need to bring back the replay room. I don't give a fuck. Who's... <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Uh, Just do it. Um, but, yeah. I think baseball could find a way to... I think there is use for a replay room. Just don't fucking put a room there next to the clubhouse where guys could take advantage and cheat. But you could do, like, football. Like, you can give guys an iPad and and uh, limit what they can look at in the iPad. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Hold on. My door is going to open. Yes. Oh, yeah. Hang on. I don't, you, you, didn't get, you, didn't get, you didn't get my text? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. Lunch. Lunch is served. Um, not even mm. hungry, to be honest. Where was I? I see where you're coming from. Like this team, there are some players popping up here and there that can make you excited for next season. And with a healthy Chris Sale, with a full season, uh, instead of this pandemic shortened, you don't know what's happening type deal, you guys could make some noise. Um, but you're the also, Red Sox, and I'm not going to give you any shine. Fuck you guys. And I know, and I know he's, he wasn't hitting well before he hit the, 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 the IL, but I'm not giving up on Andrew Benintendi either because – I don't see him as the guy that's going to emerge as like, uh, you know, our everyday top of the lineup hitter. To me, he's like a complimentary hitter on a good lineup. And we lost Mookie Betts. So that was a huge gap to fill. We didn't fill it. But I think with the signings that we could do next season, anything is possible. I really think that this team isn't in such a big of a hole as uh, some people in our fantasy baseball chat like like to think. Like me. Nah, man, I think you're, you're in a pretty big hole, personally. But all right, man, we'll see. It's just me, though. It's just me, though. I mean, think about like the Orioles. The Orioles look promising. Like the Blue Jays, if they get their rotation in order. I'm, as a Yankees fan, I'm scared because. Um, yeah, but to me, that that's what we have to do: get our rotation in order. So, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't say we're like the Blue Jays because they they outperformed us this year. But the Rays aren't going anywhere. We gonna be I I. Right. Oh the, um, man, stop the Rays. Let's not get into the Rays. I think okay. who knows? Okay. Who knows? Who knows, man? Who knows? They, them <laughs> losing them losing in the playoffs could just be a, a gut punch that will send them down a five year drought. Who knows? I don't know. I doubt it, man. All right. I have man. a lot of good young players. You think um, you think it's you think it's easy to play baseball and think that you're headed somewhere just to get bounced out at any given moment and just be like, fuck, we gotta do this again next year and it's gonna be 162 games, man. Like fuck. Aye, aye, aye. Um, I have two more things, Red Sox and Yankees related, before we move on. Um, let's stay with Red Sox because 
the show has ADD already. We don't want to make it any worse. You guys set the the record for attendance this year, man. Congratulations. Good job. Is that a joke? Yeah, that that fan broke into the stadium, climbed up the green monster from the outside somehow. How the fuck did he get up there? I saw that. I saw that. I saw that. Yeah. (laughs) And not only that, but he's the one guy from Boston that I actually like because he holds up a hat. I don't know what it says, but I I watched the video because I wrote a piece on him too, obviously. And uh, he says Boston loves New York. Something about nine eleven. Like clearly, this guy and the marathon. Yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, you know what's funny? I saw I saw a video of someone doing like a John Boy esque type of reaction to it, and he plays the audio of what the guy said. The guy did say like, "Remember nine eleven and Boston yeah. Marathon, woo!" or something. And then the yeah. guy's like, "Whatever that means." Well, like, what do you mean, whatever that means? It's pretty <laughs> obvious what he was getting at. Like, <laughs> yeah. you, you don't have to be. You don't have to be that opposing and dumb towards like right. a random fan. You know, like whatever. That's Anyways, that's like, like the the modern times is just just be oppositional and exaggerate so that you get attention that's that's all people do now and it's annoying um all right yankees aroldis chapman suspension for throwing at who was that he threw at i'm already forgetting here it was a raise that's all it was a raise player yeah that's right because because kevin cash then threatened to i remember okay anyway so his suspension is gonna (laughs) is gonna be delayed until next season because there was supposed to be a second hearing and baseball, uh, Major League Baseball can't get all the witnesses together to hear the case before the season is over. So they're just going to delay it until next year. And I have two takes on this. The first take is I fucking love it as a Yankees fan because we're not going to lose or all this shit. That's my first Because you guys, Because you guys operate as a crime family. <laughs> <laughs> there are no witnesses. The commissioner's <laughs> office is in New York for a reason. Um, oh my the, god! The second, the second thing is that it's fucked up. Like in a more rational way, it's fucked up. And and what baseball is doing now is that they're setting, they set a precedent for this last week of Major League Baseball. If you have some crazy ass pitcher out there, let's say it's let's say it's Trevor Bauer. He needs to get into the postseason so he can get his World Series title. And he's facing off against the Chicago Cubs this week, let's say. He could just go at Javi Baez's head, and there's not going to be any repercussions. He's not going to get suspended. Because if Chapman, who did this shit like a month ago, isn't going to get suspended, how could you suspend Trevor Bauer this season? There's like, you're literally in the Wild West this week. Anybody could do whatever the fuck they want. Pretty much. Don't you think? Has has anybody ever appealed a suspension and gotten away with like, you know, you're right. We were wrong. You're not you're not gonna lose any time here, man. We're sorry that we even <laughs> made you come out. Because and that's <laughs> because it's that's, like he's going to miss time. So he's why not miss just bro? Oh, this is some this is some <laughs> I am so pissed right now I could break this microphone. <laughs> and that's the thing is I don't I forget what the number of games it was. It might have been like five games or something. Why not just look at look at the past and see how many how many games are reduced for guys. Um, yeah. who've been suspended by five games. Because I feel like every time a player gets suspended for two games, he ends up serving one, essentially. Like, it's always the yeah. same numbers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's just bullshit. It's bullshit, but I, I'll take it. It is bullshit. <laughs> and that's all I have to say on the matter. I'm going to make a list of all the times the Yankees have... that have the, the, the times the Yankees have been above the law, have gone above the law. It's just, I'm tired of this, man. By the way, it was like the same thing as what Joe Kelly did, and Joe Kelly got like eight games or some shit, essentially, right? He, he threw, didn't even hit the guy. <laughs> Joe Kelly, Joe Kelly threw behind the guy, yeah. yeah. And from that, he got suspended. Both managers got served the one game suspension. Or all this Chapman threw at the guy's head at a hundred, like a hundred and three miles an hour. <laughs> and it came after they already had their little like, yeah. Tanaka had already pegged the guy, I think. And then and he, he almost, he pretty much charged the, the, he charged home plate too after he did it. Like he started coming at the guy, oh, whoever man. the hitter was. I can't remember who it was, but he looked like he had, he was on roid rage or some shit. Like he, something was going on. He looked, I was like, I don't want to fuck with chat. I wouldn't fuck with Chapman right now if I was that guy. But, yeah. um, all right. So it's going to be the Wild West this week. I'm, I'm interested to see what guys are going to do this week. Cause if, if, if I'm a psychopath on the mound, I'm going to be tossing at anybody and everybody that I want to. Fuck it. Because you're not going to get suspended. You might as well. Yep. A lo foque, as we say. Um, so, Manny, I have one thing that I want to touch on 
before we end the episode and we've touched on it in the past. So there's a lot of sports. I don't think I've ever realized it as much as I realized it this last week, but football's back. Uh, NBA's back Mm -hmm. and baseball's coming to an end soon. Not NBA's back. NBA is also coming to an end soon. But every one of those sports have that like downtime where you're just sitting there watching a screen of guys like trying to figure out what's going on and they're just looking at each other and the officials are getting together to figure something out. All, all this crap, right? And mm-hmm. then you hear about you. I listen to a lot of sports trade and a lot of fans always talk about how much they hate the replay system because it takes too long. We know the outcome two minutes before the umpires know the outcome and all that stuff. And they got a good point and they, and they attribute that to the game taking so long or whatever. And they, and they make a good point, but we've already talked about this in the past baseball. I'm, I'm a full on board with this. They need to implement a pitch clock and a hitters clock and like a third clock in between. So the way that I would picture it working is I'll, I'll explain how I picture it working, but the reason is, Robinson Cano had a really good, interesting at bat against Nick Anderson. I spoke about it before, Mm -hmm. but this guy takes so long to get into the batter's box and get ready to hit. It's annoying. And I, I believe that hitters need to go through their superstitious movements. Maybe it's more of like a comfort thing for them to step into a batter's box and hit what they're paid to do. And I don't want to put any restrictions on that, but it's ridiculous, man. Like this guy, he took, he takes a long time to get into this batter's box. Nick Anderson is already just there wait, waiting for him to get ready pretty much. Mm-hmm. And out of nowhere, his Velcro elbow guard pops off. So he had to stop the bat again, <laughs> fix that, and then go through his whole thing again. And the first time I realized how, how dull that is, is, and it's been hitting me in the face all year long. Robbie, uh, Raphael Devers does the exact same thing every time he gets into the batter's box. He, like, blows out a, a, a breath of air, mm-hmm. closes his eyes, spits back and forth, whatever. And they show it almost two to three times every time he's, at, he's, he's, at, he's batting. If you're watching the Nesson broadcast, they'll show it every time. And yeah. I'm just sitting there, like, I could never see this again in my life, like, yeah, it was cool when we try to imitate these guys back in the day, like all the little stuff they did, Omar Garcia Parra and all that stuff. But I think that I can officially say we're good. And they need to implement some sort of clock that mm-hmm. this is how much time both either the pitcher or the batter have to get in position to hit. Once the batter gets in position, a, a different clock starts for the pitcher in which if he doesn't get ready within that time, it's an automatic ball, let's say. Yeah. And if the and if vice versa, if the pitcher gets set to pitch, then the batter now has a clock time to get into the batter's box and get ready to hit. Yeah. Now the implications would be things like when the Velcro elbow guard pops off or or something. How would they track it? Is it fair to give a guy a ball and a strike when a pitch wasn't thrown? Um, but something, man, I feel like that would fix the dullness of baseball because honestly, if I have a choice to watch. Football, yeah, and football gets dull too when they're trying to figure out penalties. And NBA basketball gets dull when you got when you got guys flopping and the refs have to get together to figure things out and they're all like whining. I hate the NBA for that, anyways, by the way. But I'm true, I'm finding myself in a very long baseball game. If I see a guy like fixing his batting gloves in between an at bat, in between two pitches, I, I find myself switching the channel. And I think they really need to hammer home what a pitch clock would be like and enforce it. The only way I figured they would enforce it is to tack on a ball or a strike mm-hmm. if, if it comes to that. But, you know. No, I'm with know. you. I would just put one clock, like, like in the NBA. Like, um, say it's a 24-second clock. And by the way, I'm looking at in 2000, and this came out in July 8th, 2019. Let me see if there's something newer. I don't see anything newer. But the, the pitchers who take the longest in between pitches are Sonny Gray, 28 seconds. Alex Cobb, 27 seconds. Hugh Darvish, 27 seconds. Justin Verlander, Jason Hamill, and Jeremy Hellickson are tied for 26.9 seconds. And the reliever with the longest time between pitches is Pedro Baez with 31.1 seconds. 
I know that sounds like a like it's not that long of a time, but I'm I'm just using Davy Garcia as an exper- as an example because he's the most recent person I saw. He seemed to be ready to go as soon as he got the ball back. Like there was a game plan. He knew what he wanted to do. Got the ball. He was ready to toss. Another good example on the hitter side is John Carlos Stanton. You never see him step out of the batter's box. He just stays there. I don't even know how he does it, but he stays there. Um, and I think Aaron Judge does it too. He might pick up a, a dirt and rub his hands, and then he's right back into it. He's not adjusting his gloves and all that stuff constantly. I would put one clock, and let's say it's 25 seconds. Just put one clock up, and whoever isn't ready when that clock is up, that that person gets penalized. So maybe the the if it's a right-handed hitter, the first base co. No wait, that's the left side. The third base uh, ump could decide if, if it was the if it was the batter. If, if it's a left-handed hitter, the first base umpire. If it was the pitcher, then the, the home plate umpire would decide if the pitcher violated the pitch clock. And whoever violates it, like you said, if it's the pitcher, he gets a ball call. If it's the batter, the batter gets a strike call. And that's it. And move move on and and implement this shit because there are there are rules about not stepping out of the batter's box, but it doesn't get implemented. You see it all the time and nothing happens. Um, and I've and and like there's times you're right where you're just like what the, like you know who complains a lot about it is John Sterling and uh, Susan Waldman. If you ever listen to the by the way they complain a lot. Like I've been listening to the broadcast a lot lately. They're always complaining. But anyway, um, it's true. Like you're just like what the fuck, man. Like keep the game moving here. Like the interruption, the interruption, the constant interruptions are annoying. And I feel like it's most of it happens before the pitch is being delivered. I feel like saying it out loud and walking through it in my brain, I'm, I'm already coming across all these implications about how this would work. The reason why I think there needs to be multiple clocks is because it'll, it'll rely on who's ready first. If the batter is ready first, then the official clock starts from that point on. But then I start thinking, well, you know, what about all the signs that a catcher has to put down and the pitcher needs to – uh, but but agree I agree like, to, you know, I feel like that's part of the game. You know, it's like in the NBA, if you don't execute the play within that 24 seconds, you're going to have to chuck up a shitty shot and take your chances. The same thing has to happen in baseball too. Like if you're, yeah. you and your pitcher can't decide on a sign, then you're going to have to just throw a fastball right down the middle or some shit or, or throw a ball intentionally or some shit. You know what I mean? No, like, you're right. You're right. You're right. I would, I would be on board with that because it's ridiculous already what I've been seeing. And I think um, it, would, it would add an element of entertainment. Like, if there's a pitch clock on the screen and you're seeing that your pitcher isn't ready or your hitter is not in the box, you're going to be like, come on, man, hurry up. It's like like watching a football game, like a delay yeah. game or whatever. You know what I'm saying? No, I would agree, man. And I think that if we dedicate a, some time in the offseason, we can come up with an official set of rules how this would play out. We could think of all the different scenarios. We could pitch it yeah. to MLB. Shit, we because could, we could make a plan that starting next year that we could just do it ourselves on social media and show like, look, this, like if yeah. you had a pitch clock, just put it up, like take video, like pitching ninja or whatever with a pitch clock and show like, this is how fast the game could move. If there was a pitch clock, like this would be a violation. This would be a violation. You know what I mean? I almost feel like there should be a, a third clock that when the batter and pitcher are both ready, they have five to 10 seconds after that. The pitcher has five to ten seconds after that to deliver a pitch. Yeah. And the batter only gets one timeout per at bat. Mm-hmm. And we'll keep building on that. But seriously, man, like this because all these sports are happening at the same time and I'm basically flipping between channels. I'll find myself flipping to a game. And if I see like the batter just like doing all I'll his switch. little things, I'll just be like, all right, I'll come back when this at bat's over, I guess. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I know, I know that some like I, I didn't watch that Nick Anderson Cano at bat, but I bet Cano was pl- just trying to play mind games with Nick Anderson, like th- throwing is, him off his timing or some shit like that. Which is fine, but I don't know, man. At what expense? Like if if it's at the expense of entertaining fans, and baseball's trying to attract fans, like they're allowing players to wear custom cleats and shit like that. Um, this is one of those things you're going to have to sacrifice. Like, fuck the mind games. You have to move move quickly. Speaking of custom cleats, have you been keeping up with Trevor Bauer's yeah. charades? Yeah, now, the trash cans. <laughs> <laughs> now, have you thought about Trevor Bauer's off, off-field antics playing a part in him not being the Cy Young this year? 
Oh yeah, definitely. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of old school writers who love baseball the old way and they don't like the showboating and all this stuff. And the fact that Jacob DeGrom could be considered this year's Cy Young again, they might just give it to a guy like DeGrom just to, you know, as sort yeah. of like a F you to Trevor Bauer for trying to be the funny guy and all this. At the same time, I think that Trevor Bauer is, and I've said this before, he knows what he's doing. Like, I think if yeah. we follow, if baseball were to follow his lead more, I'm not saying do everything he does, the game would be in a lot, a lot better shape in terms of popularity. Um, mm-hmm. And speaking of custom cleats, I was listening to Manny Machado's interview on the CC Sabathia podcast, and he was talking about how he he decides like the 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 design of his cleats before the season. He's a he's a member of the Jordan brand, and I was thinking. And maybe they do do this, but why don't they? I know they did with the Griffies. Those are the only sneakers I can remember that you could wear without cleats, like as a fashion statement. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Some of these cleats are really cool. I can't think of one off the top of my head right now, but why not release them as a shoe brand, like a brand that you could wear out, not just cleats? I'm not saying I'm going to wear trash cans on my, on my shoes like Trevor Bauer did, mm-hmm. but I should have looked this up before I got on here. But, uh, Ryan Rucco and Cece were, they were in love with Manny Machado's safari cleats. I'm going to look them up right now. Um, And I was thinking, why not like market that as a shoe brand? You know what I mean? Like I'm going to get the Machados like you do with, with, with uh, NBA sneakers. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that. a lot of people like that shit. I know that when I taught in New York city uh, with middle school students, that was a, big part of of life for them their sneakers the type of sneakers they wore that was a big deal so try to integrate baseball into that and i think people would watch younger people speaking of manny machado he is the he's tied for the home run lead in the national league he's the league leader in total bases having a beast beast season word for all you haters out there uh and speaking of home run leaders luke voigt Leads the league with 21 home runs. Beast. Followed by Jose Abreu, 18. Nelson Cruz, 16. Mike Trout, 16. What can I say, man? Z balls are juiced. All right. We just had to throw them under the bus there. I'm going to give you guys the top the top 10 um, net runs producers. You can check on Twitter. But Freddie Freeman is one. Jose Abreu, Juan Soto, Luke Voigt. Wait a minute. That's not true. Just net runs in order from one to ten. It's Freeman, Abreu, Tatis, Machado, Luke Voigt, Trout, Betts, Osuna, Swanson, and Kyle Tucker. If you want to break that up by plate appearance, like who produces the most runs per plate appearance, it's Freeman, Voigt, Soto, Abreu, Kyle Tucker, Dominic Smith, Manny Machado, Ronald, Ronald Acuna Jr., Tatis, and then Real Muto. And if you want to break that up by games, like how many runs a player produces per game, you got Freeman, Abreu, Soto, Voigt, Trout, Tatis, Machado, uh, Acuna, Betts, and Tim Anderson. So like one or two players get swapped out here and there. And I, I'm starting to feel like net runs per game is the most useful one because you get to see how many runs a player contributes to his team in every single game. And according to this stat, Freddie Freeman contributes one and a half runs essentially to his team in every single game. That's huge. I think like you can count on Freddie Freeman to give you almost two runs a game. You know what I mean? You need, you need one or two more, you know, the rest of your team to give you the other half of that. And you should be able to win the game at that point. You know, I know that we all want Fernando Tatis to win the MVP and I don't know what's getting filtered out in this list, but it looks like Mookie is the leader in war mm-hmm. in both leagues. It'd be, it'd be Mookie Betts. But looking at Freddie Freeman's numbers, I don't know how they don't He's, give him the MVP this year. I, the, he has to be. He has to be the MVP. The only guys that compare in the National League, and I know everybody's having a, a lot of people are performing well, but some of these numbers just jump out at you. And Juan Soto has similar numbers, but he's played in 14 less games. Ronald Acuna has similar numbers, but he's also played like in 14 less games than Freddie Freeman. Mm. So 
it's going to look like a robbery if they give it to Freddie Freeman when you have guys like Tatis performing this year and he's like the all around, all around best player or Mookie, who's the leader in war overall and everything. But Freddie Freeman, man, I don't see how they don't give it to him this year as well. Like, yeah, well, that's what I mean. If you if you break down that stat just per game, Juan Soto's third in baseball, one point four runs, uh, per game, and Freddie mm-hmm. Freeman leads the pack. The problem is, how much do you value defense? How much do you value the other components of the game that that a player contributes? Like Tatis is a is a great defender. He can run the bases. He plays a harder position. Um, he's more versatile, whereas. Freddie Freeman is a first baseman, doesn't really do much. He doesn't run the bases that well. Um, but he definitely has the best bat in baseball. So is Tatis the MVP, the most valuable player to the San Diego Padres? And and Freddie Freeman is the Hank Aaron Award winner, maybe. You know what I mean? That's the problem with the MVP. Like, how do we define it? You know what, you know what I'm saying? Because you could also say that Manny Machado has been the most valuable player to the Padres. He's been a beast this season. Well, that's the thing. Uh, and so has Ronald Acuna to the Braves. Exactly. But Acuna's been hurt a lot. He's played less games. But, that, yeah, I don't know. It's tough to say. Jose Abreu's been – I think Jose Abreu's probably hands down the, the MVP in the AL. Yeah, I feel like in the AL there's, there's like, the top three that it'll, it'll be, and it'll be easier to hash out who really deserves it. But in the NL, there's just so many guys, you yeah. know? Even, even Marcelo Zuno's having a B season. Yeah. So that kind of takes away from my what would have been my argument for Freddie Freeman. But I just wanted to point out that Freddie Freeman is quietly probably having the best statistical season out and of tested, all of them. And tested positive for COVID. Barely had a spring training because of it. That's true. So did Juan Soto, though. And by the, Yeah, that's true. And by the way, Freddie Freeman was so sick, apparently, from COVID that Nick Markakis decided to opt out. Remember that? Yeah. He had a conversation with Freddie Freeman. And he was like, I'm not playing. Like, I don't want this shit. Although Marquez ended up coming back, but um, I can't believe he's having this kind of season because then you then you have someone like uh, Yoan Makata with the White Sox who says he still he he still hasn't recovered from COVID. Yeah. Um, so impressive. I think it's gonna be I think it's gonna be Freddie Freeman, and I think it's gonna be Jose Abreu. In the AL, don't count out DJ LeMahieu either. I don't know. I don't think that's gonna happen. He's he's having a Freddie Freeman esque type of performance yeah. and he's the home run number is double digits i didn't realize I think, that i think if if this was 20 years ago it would be lemayhu because of the 365 batting average okay but it's a different world it seems can like get, every can we give some love to tim anderson i love this guy man yeah it seems like and i gotta look this up but it seems like every mvp candidate has a a partner in that team who's also yeah. an MVP candidate. So we have Machado and Tatis. Mm-hmm. We have Tim Anderson and Abreu. We have Freeman, Freeman and, and Acuna. Acuna or, or Ozuna, if you want to look Ozuna. at that. Uh, DJ LeMayhew, if you want to consider him a candidate. And, and Voight. Um, that's interesting. There should They're be an a- award. There should be an award for co. Yeah. Like there should be a a Manny and Ortiz mm-hmm. award type of thing, you know, like uh, Delgado and Beltran type of award. Like yeah, two, yeah. two two teammates who both kept the team, like you know, whatever. Yeah, like if this team was a playoff contender, you could say Rendon and Mike Trout. Uh, let's see. I guess besides Mike Trout, I mean, I don't know how Rendon's doing this year, but He's, I guess I Mike mean, Trout. He's top 10 in F4. He's having a good season. Yep. He's having a really good season. Wow. Um, yeah. 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 Mike Yastrzemski and this this other dude from the Giants who's been raking too. Yeah, I know you're talking about the... Uh, um, um, I just said his name before. Nope, wrong guy. Kyle Tucker's with the Astros. I changed my mind. The guy that you're talking about is Donovan Solano. Mm. Mm. Is that who you were talking about? I don't know what that sound was. Yeah. Will Myers, by the way. Will Myers. That the Padres is such a dangerous team. 
let me see the Padres. The, there, there is a situation where the Padres could overtake the Dodgers. I don't think it's going to happen, but that's how good they've been. Brandon Bell is having an, uh, an amazing season. <laughs> juice, juice baseballs. And like you said, Jesus. And like you said, 60 games. Like, I bet if we go back, I bet we could, I bet if we go back, we could bring ourselves down to earth a little bit. If we go back and break, break down like 60 game stretches for some of these players you know what i mean they've, they've probably had better 60 game stretches yeah, than what yeah. we're looking at. Yeah, yeah you're right you're right you're right man hey Calm all down. right man we're dragging we're dragging this on at this point um, we are let's let's end it here do you are, do you have a sign off you want to do here since you since you started us off you know with the new way i do not have a sign off i am mm. sorry um Let's just uh let's cut let's just end it. Let's just end it. All right, guys. Peace out. Thanks for watching and listening. Subscribe to our channel, comment on our channels, pages, anywhere you see us. Interact. We respond. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>